And uh, all day I had a headache, I felt the aches in the arms. And I said to my wife, I said, sweetheart, I said, uh, I'm going to have a lie down. Don't feel so good. And uh, put the video on for the children. I, and I went upstairs and I said, uh, and I very rarely go to the doctors. And I didn't feel so good at all. Then I felt this unusual pain in the middle of the stomach. And I shouted downstairs, I said, Alison, you better go and get a doctor. Things aren't right here. And uh, she phoned up the doctor. I said, forget about the doctor, get an ambulance. And I had this almighty pain. In March 1994, 43-year-old Richard Campbell was rushed to hospital after a sudden heart attack. Until then, like most of us, he thought that his health depended mainly on diet, exercise and smoking. But is that true? Some scientists now think it isn't. Death is called the Great Leveller. It gets us all in the end. But it doesn't get us all at the same time. So what are the real reasons why some people live longer and healthier lives than others? Over the last few years, a range of pioneering health research has unearthed surprising new answers to these very old questions. The implications of this work are revolutionary. Yet it all started with a man in a library, Richard Wilkinson, an academic with an unusual past. Spent a good many years doing manual work of different kinds, um, machine operating, garage work, building sites, all the rest of it. It means that one asks different questions. Wilkinson is an economic historian at Sussex University. He is also a scientific detective, pooling together research from across the world and from a wide range of disciplines, epidemiology to endocrinology, psychology to primatology. He's examined striking similarities between the health of civil servants in Whitehall and baboons in the Serengeti, found unexpected parallels between the life expectancy of the British during the Blitz and Hungarians under Soviet occupation. All this to explain a curious paradox. Within a society, rich people tend to be healthier than poor ones, as you might expect. But for some reason, rich countries are not necessarily healthier than poor ones. Most of the improvement in life expectancy seems to have nothing to do anymore with uh, what's happening to our standard of living. So you get countries as rich as the United States that have worse health than countries as poor as, say, Greece or the poorer developed countries. And it gets weirder. In the late 60s and early 70s, affluent West Germans didn't live as long as their Eastern counterparts. Richard then noticed a pattern. Wealth didn't determine health. What did was the gap between rich and poor. The larger the gap, the sicker the country. He began to feel that something about living in very hierarchical societies was bad for us. Even amongst people who work together in the same offices, not subjected to such very different material circumstances, uh, death rates are perhaps three times as high amongst the most junior office workers amongst, as amongst the most senior. And slowly these kinds of things made me think that one had to perhaps interpret this in terms of um, the social and psychological impact um, of the differences themselves. Given our famous class system, perhaps it's not surprising that Britain is the world leader in studying the effects of social status on health. Since the Second World War, we have been systematically recording the health of large sections of our population. In longitudinal studies, that is, studies in which the same children are seen repeatedly from year to year as they grow, in these studies, the recorder checks each child's measurements against his previous ones. Perhaps the most ambitious study of all, and one that provides dramatic evidence of the effects of status on health, comes from an ongoing investigation of the health of the great 
British civil servant. It's called the Whitehall Study and is the largest of its type in the world. There is a 50-strong department at University College London dedicated to it. Here, they store questionnaires filled in for the last 30 years by over 10,000 civil servants. The original questionnaire aimed to find out the main causes of heart disease. It turned out to be full of surprises. It had been anticipated that executive stress would show high rates of heart disease at the top of the civil service and low rates at the bottom. In fact, quite the reverse was evident. The lowest rates of heart disease were in the very top permanent secretary, uh, assistant permanent secretary ranks. And as you descended the grades, the risk became progressively higher and higher. Civil service rank predicted life expectancy more accurately than any single factor. Known risks like diet, exercise and smoking were responsible for only 40% of the health difference between people on different grades, leaving 60% of the difference in health to be explained, apparently, by status alone. A remarkable conclusion. To see how different life is at different civil service grades, let's meet two men called Richard. Sir Richard Way was permanent secretary, that's boss to the rest of us, at the Ministry of Defence and later Aviation. Richard Campbell was in the middle of the civil service hierarchy as a fire safety inspector at the Home Office. They both have hearty appetites, both did moderate exercise and neither smoked. Sir Richard is 83 and as fit as a fiddle. Richard Campbell now has a new job running fire safety for a Greenwich hospital. But he had to leave the Home Office when he nearly died of a heart attack, aged 43. What's different is the way the two Richards saw their civil service jobs. Listen to Sir Richard as he remembers taking over at the MOD. I can almost remember the date. It was in 1960, in January 1960. And it was a very emotional moment. But um, it had a large, a very large marble staircase. It was built in about 1905. Large marble staircase going up to the second floor where all these and the senior people were from the sector state downwards. And it, it, I, I remember going up those stairs and feeling, well, this is mine. I don't like to say it, but I think it was the power. I mean, the fact that you felt you had a large department of state wholly under your control. I mean, it's, 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 it's as simple and as nasty as that. Yes. For Richard Campbell, with many layers of civil service management above him, life was quite different. My line manager used to change his mind well, we so many times. The, uh, and uh, I would do one way, do, the, do a job one way, which he asked me to do. And then he would say, well, why did you do that? I said, well, you told me to do it. I felt really annoyed. I felt tense. Uh, I felt like throwing the files out of the window. Uh, in actual fact, not for me, I wouldn't, I'd like to give him a smack on the, na on the mouth, actually. And uh, I never really felt in control of my job as a fire inspector. Never felt in control at all. It all came to a head when Richard felt he was unfairly blamed for things that weren't his doing. Then came his annual report. He got what's called a box three, a lower mark than the box two he expected. The next day, he had his heart attack and was rushed to hospital. And I felt them give me the electric shocks. And um, I, I remember going to this ward or intensive care. And all, even then, I was still thinking about work. Richard Campbell was worrying about his annual report. Sir Richard Way had to deal with affairs of state including several years negotiating with the French over Concord. Uh, I never had sleepless nights. I, I, on the whole, I, I, I didn't worry. And I used to get up very early in the morning, and I mean two o'clock, to do letters to try and keep it going. By the time you become a permanent secretary, I think you've ceased to be a warrior, and therefore you've ceased to be too vulnerable to what is in these days called stress. I was talking to my other colleagues, who were also the same grade, five inspectors, 
and they were experiencing similar problems. So there's about four or five inspectors of the same grade. Uh, a lot of them all went sick. Well, I'm over 80 years old now, so I suppose I've, I, I, I've got to say, for my age, I'm comparatively healthy. Uh, during my civil service career, I had hardly any sick leave. Not being in control, the rush of adrenaline trying to do things right, the frustration, uh, the continual arguments. Now, that can't be good for anybody. That in itself caused, I know, to be the cause of the heart attack. But perhaps it isn't being at the top like Sir Richard was that makes you healthy. Perhaps it's because he is so healthy that Sir Richard got to the top. This explanation is known as healthy drift. A lot of work went into checking out that kind of explanation. Um, and they involved large studies that have followed children through since birth to the uh, middle age um, and trying to see what happens to the unhealthy ones. And sure enough, there is an effect. Um, unhealthy children are less likely to move up than healthy ones. But it is a small effect. It explains rather little of the overall differences we see. All right, so you've got 43 fives. Uh, Work played a key part in Richard Campbell's heart attack. Although, like all such disease, it was probably caused by a mixture of stress, diet and personality. What's this unauthorised absence of... But the researchers running the Whitehall study are concerned with averages, not individuals. When you add up hundreds of examples, it's impossible to ignore the effects of hierarchy. Here at University College Hospital, they have fridges full of the blood of civil servants, just like the two Richards. These samples clearly show that the lower down the pecking order you are, the less healthy your blood is, even after taking diet, exercise and smoking into account. Ordinarily, blood runs freely. In it is a substance called fibrinogen. It stops us bleeding to death by making blood clot when it is exposed to air. But too much fibrinogen can be dangerous putting us at an increased risk of developing blood clots and serious heart problems. We have here a fibrinogen level of 4.58 grams per litre, which is a very high level, which would correlate with some of the lower ranking civil servants and individuals with such high fibrinogen levels are at extremely high risk of developing heart attacks in the near future. To their astonishment, the Whitehall researchers found an exact match between fibrinogen levels and civil service rank. The lower the rank, the higher the fibrinogen level. They received another surprise when they looked at a type of fat called high-density lipoprotein. This material is dissolved in the blood and is believed to reduce the risk of heart disease. It's good stuff. Eric Brunner discovered that the higher your civil service rank, the more high-density lipoprotein you have. So, can status really affect biology? Powerful support for this idea then came from an unexpected source. The same predictors of ill health in the blood of low-status civil servants can be seen in low-status baboons. A scientist from Stanford University in California called Robert Sapolsky has brought together two areas of expertise. He spends his summers in the Serengeti studying baboon behavior and the rest of the year in the laboratory looking into their body chemistry. Like humans, these baboons live in social hierarchies. And like humans, this seems to affect their health. If you're a baboon and you get a choice in the matter, you want to be a high-ranking one. Repeatedly, it looked as if your social rank had an awful lot to do with how your body worked. And consistently, if you were a low-ranking animal, you had the sort of physiological profiles that we think of as maybe setting you up for stress-related disease. When the Whitehall researchers came across Sapolsky's work, they saw an obvious parallel with their own results. 
I found a paper by Sapolsky looking at his baboons in the Serengeti, and much to my amazement, I found exactly the same pattern of lipoproteins according to the dominance hierarchy in baboons as in civil servants. Hierarchy is perhaps the only thing that baboons and civil servants have in common. High-ranking baboons get first access to fruit. High-ranking civil servants get big offices and more pay. Low-ranking baboons have to show their bottoms to seniors. Low-ranking civil servants have to take orders from seniors. High-rankers of both species decide what to do and when. While low-rankers get beaten up at random, have unpredictable lives and lack any real sense of control. You are more likely to be stressed if you feel like you have no control. If you feel like you have no outlets for the frustration, if you feel like you have no predictability as to when the stressor is coming, how bad it's going to be, these are the cornerstones of psychological stress, lack of outlets, lack of control, lack of predictability, lack of social support, and overwhelmingly, these are hallmarks of being socially subordinate animals. What we find, in fact, is that the people in, a, in the higher echelons have got loads of control at work. So although they have responsibility, they are able to deal with the tasks which land on their desk. The people lower down not only have monotonous work, but they also have very little option to decide how and when they do their job. So how could a lack of control physically make us ill? It's connected with what's known as the stress response, which exists to help us get away from immediate danger. When we notice a predator, our brain sends a chemical message shooting along our nerves to a tiny gland called the adrenal that sits on top of the kidneys. The adrenal gland then secretes two hormones into the blood, cortisol and adrenaline. These are the two hormones that you absolutely have to secrete into your bloodstream if you plan on running for your life with some lion coming after you. They mobilize energy, and essentially what that is is they're going to your fat, they're going to your liver, they're getting all this energy stored away in the bank, dump it into the bloodstream, hand it to whichever muscles are going to save your neck. But cortisol and adrenaline don't only deliver a short burst of energy, they have another role. And they turn off all sorts of long-term building projects in your body. And the logic there is obvious. There's some major storm coming today. This isn't the day you go out in the backyard to plant tulips sort of thing. Um, you turn off digestion. You're avoiding being somebody's lunch. Don't worry about breakfast. You turn off reproduction. You turn off growth. You turn off mm, tissue repair, all sorts of things. You know, and the logic there, again, you're running for your life. Ovulate some other day. Hit puberty next week. Don't bother with it right now. The problem for humans is that we use this very dramatic stress response, flooding our system with cortisol, whenever we feel threatened or out of control, whether it's a charging lion or a bad day at the office. Most animals turn on stress responses for three minutes during a physical emergency, and we turn it on for 30 years worrying about taxes. And in the latter case, that makes no sense at all. And the centerpiece of stress-related disease is, if you do it for the latter reasons too often, you're going to get sick. You can't increase your blood pressure all the time without suffering from hypertension. You can't turn off ovulation, sperm production, tissue repair, bone recalcification, rebuilding stomach walls without putting yourself at risk for reproductive problems, immunosuppression, osteoporosis, ulcers, all of that. Some scientists also believe cortisol interferes with the liver's ability to regulate fat levels. And perhaps this explains why low-status civil servants and baboons have less healthy blood. Basically, cortisol is bad news. Turn the system on for five minutes for a physical emergency, saves your life, do it chronically, and you are at risk for half of the diseases that we've invented in Western society. <laughs>
Observations of the damaging effects of hierarchy on baboons and civil servants in their natural habitats is good evidence for Richard Wilkinson. But it's impossible to rule out all the variables in the wild. A time for another piece of the jigsaw. Meet Zeus. He sits in the food bucket to show he is the chief of this clan of stump-tail macaques. They live at the Bowman Gray School of Medicine in North Carolina. Here, every detail of an animal's life, from how much it eats to how well it sleeps, can be closely monitored and controlled. That's what psychologist Carol Shively does. For most of her professional life, she has investigated the health effects of social stress and specifically, hierarchy. Below Zeus, there is a pecking order which dictates who gets access to food first, who gets groomed more, and who gives way if there are disagreements. This is uh, one of the younger females in the group, and she's isolated and alone, so she does not benefit from the positive aspects of being social, but being subordinate, she's subject to more aggression. In captivity, the animal's environment can be subtly altered to see how social interactions affect psychology and how that affects disease. With the monkeys, what, what is so great about this animal model is that we can go in and actually measure the amount of disease that occurs in association with things like subordinate social status. And I think it is... Um, um, very appropriate to go ahead and say that behavior is causing disease, actually. Carol Shively was determined to see how status alone affects health. She has rigorously eliminated all other variables, like diet. We would have, oh, 50 or 100 or maybe more animals in an experiment, and they would live in small social groups of four to six females each, perhaps. Now, they're all about the same age. We make our diet here, and it's very carefully prepared to have about the same amount of fat and cholesterol in it as um, people in North America eat. So, um, about 40% of calories from fat. And they're fed on a very controlled basis. Believe it or not, these unappetizing green patties contain exactly the same carbohydrates, fat, roughage and proteins as a burger, fries and side salad. And they would live that way for, well, perhaps two to three years. And at that point, we go in and take a look at their coronary arteries and see how atherosclerosis development has proceeded. There was an amazing difference between uh, the arteries of socially subordinate monkeys and the arteries of socially dominant monkeys. The subordinates had much more extensive atherosclerosis. So what we have here is the cross-section of a coronary artery of a dominant female cinemologous monkey. This is a very clean coronary artery, and it's, if it's healthy, it's only about one cell layer thick, and it sits right on this nice dark line that you can see goes uninterrupted all the way around a perfectly round and healthy looking artery. Now the blood flows through the hole, so there's um, plenty of blood flow through this particular artery and very little atherosclerosis around the outside. And now if we take this away and put up a section of a coronary artery of a subordinate, now what you see is a great deal of atherosclerosis present. The way you know that is this little line that goes all the way around should be intact on the in entire circumference of the artery. And here we see that it has broken down in places and that there has been proliferation of tissue inside that dark line. And that is actually the atherosclerotic plaque that has developed. When it becomes unstable, it can break free and floats downstream to a narrow part of the coronary artery and blocks it completely, and that's a heart attack. These arteries are from two monkeys of the same age. They lived in identical conditions and ate the same food. The only difference was that the one on the left was higher status. But maybe dominant monkeys inherit healthy hearts. Perhaps they're risen because of relaxed personalities. But to prove this isn't a genetic effect, Carol Shively moved top monkeys into groups where they became subordinates. Their arteries clogged up. 
Hal Shively believes that this variation in health is caused because animals of different status interpret the world around them differently. A high-status monkey has been fitted with a jacket to measure its blood pressure and heart rate. It's put in a box and shown unusual objects. In this case, the most unusual was our cameraman who was behind a small window. The high-status monkey's pulse hardly rises. It goes up from a rest rate of 120 to 131. Then a low-status monkey was brought to the same box. When it sees the cameraman, its pulse rate goes up from 120 to over 200. Being low status teaches a monkey to be much more wary of the world around it. The animal is, is always sort of in this state of high arousal and um, behaviorally the subordinates exhibit that by um, uh, they're constantly scanning vigilantly their, their social environment and they're keeping track of everyone else in their group because they have to get out of the way if a dominant comes along or else they risk an aggressive interaction. So when you have high blood pressure and high heart rate, you have more molecules are being forced against the artery wall. And it's that sheer force then that uh, appears to damage the cells that line the innermost part of the artery. So is there any hope for a subordinate animal? The good news is that low status monkeys can counter the damaging effects of stress by being friendly and supportive. Monkeys commonly do this by grooming each other. When they do, their heart rates drop dramatically. Conversely, if you isolate a monkey of any status, its heart rates rise and arteries are damaged. Robert Sapolsky observed the same effect in baboons. Subordinates who were good at socializing were much healthier than they had expected. You'll have two low-ranking baboons. Both of them are being subjected to the exact same indignities, all the same problems, all the stressors, all the same rates of high-ranking animals having a bad day, taking it out on them. Yet one of them has far lower levels of cortisol. What's that guy doing differently? What you wind up seeing is he's social. He has friends. He plays with babies, and that's something you almost never see with male baboons. He will groom with females, even if they're not sexually receptive, and that's a very rare thing for a baboon. Baboons almost never interact with females unless it's for sex. They have friends. They're platonic. They're just friends. These guys do things very differently. So, baboons behaving badly are not as healthy as caring, sharing ones. Is it possible that the same thing can be seen in humans? What happens to human health when we become friendlier and more supportive? when external circumstances disrupt normal social hierarchies and make the divisions between us disappear. Was it possible that um, in some way societies with smaller income differences had a higher state of, if you like, psychological, social welfare? Um, and I started to look at a, a number of cases of societies that had been um, unusually egalitarian in terms of their income differences and unusually healthy. The air raid alarm is sounded in the first hour of war. An unknown plane approaches the coast. Londoners enter the war shelters. The first example Richard Wilkinson examined was Britain during the two world wars. First, there was no doubt that during both conflicts, Britain became a much more egalitarian society. The thousand classes of London, some from their damp basements and some from their luxury flats, came to work for the public good. The statistics show that, of course, the war effort mopped up unemployment. They also show that amongst people in employment, there was a big narrowing of income differences. In these days of war, they are one big family. And there was a concerted government policy um, to enlist people in the war effort by making society more egalitarian, of sharing the tax burden more equally, of subsidizing necessities and taxing um, luxuries, um, and a number of other policies designed to make this a, a shared burden and a common effort. British health improved dramatically during the war decades. Life expectancy went up by seven years two to three times better than any other decade this century. 
During the Second World War, this was partly due to a low-fat diet imposed by rationing. But death rates from all diseases fell, including ones that have very little to do with food. Also, there was little dietary change during the First World War, and health improved markedly then. To these residents of a sheltered housing unit in Leighton who are watching a show about the Blitz spirit, the war was the most memorable event of their lives. These people endured appalling housing and poor health care as the country poured its resources into fighting the Germans, but they still remember the war with fondness and warmth. sausages or liver down the road, one of your neighbours would come and tell you, and you'd all go down and queue up and have an atom while you queued up, but you took it in its stride, didn't you? The street stores was open. If they wasn't open, there was a key in the door. Knock at the door. Don't worry. We'll knock at the door. We've got it. You can have it. The togetherness in the face of a common enemy seems to have overcome the damaging stresses of peacetime hierarchies. When you're fighting the Nazis, the frustrations of unemployment or a difficult boss become irrelevant. As long as a V2 doesn't land in your shelter, war is good for your health. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. There was much more of a fellow feeling amongst people than there has been since. And I think that's something that, in talking to people, that they, they are aware of the loss of that. Um, you know, it's sad that it has to be something like war that actually evokes that sort of community spirit. Richard Wilkinson examined other unusually egalitarian countries and found that communist states at their most totalitarian were amazingly healthy, often healthier than us despite being considerably poorer. More bizarre still, some, like Hungary, that got richer, got sicker. And that is particularly interesting for me, I suppose, because despite its economic progress, um, it's... Uh, it ends up moving from the highest life expectancy or near the highest in Eastern Europe to uh, the lowest um, by the late 80s. This issue has resulted in a flurry of email from Richard Wilkinson's office in Sussex University to the Budapest office of his Hungarian counterpart, epidemiologist Professor Maria Kopp. Maria Kopp has written several papers on why prosperity seems to make Hungarians ill. Equinox took Richard Wilkinson to Budapest to meet Maria Kopp for the first time. His work had inspired her to make the bold claim that Hungary's current status as one of the unhealthiest countries in Europe is because the strong social bonds that existed between people in the 50s and early 60s have disappeared. Today, the gap between rich and poor is far wider than it was, but all Hungarians were under a brutal Soviet occupation. There were everywhere the barracks of the Soviet soldiers. They were, they were everywhere on the streets, and therefore, at that time, there was a much higher level of cohesion within the society. We can see under the pressure, uh, the person, the, the people were much more together. They had a, a sense of, of uh, uh, need for, for uh, helping each other. There was much closer uh, connection between the families, between the relatives. Soviet occupation seems to have brought out the blitz spirit in the Hungarians. 
By the mid-50s, there was a groundswell of popular feeling against the Russian occupation. The Hungarians began heroic bid for freedom with a fight for life against red oppression. In 1956, it reached a head. Thousands took to the streets and tore down the statues of Stalin. The communist puppet government was ousted. For a short while, Hungary was free. But in spite of promises that they would leave the country, and even while talks were in progress, they came back. Within weeks, Soviet tanks rolled in and crushed the insurgents. But their attitude to Hungary changed. To prevent future uprisings, they gradually introduced a series of economic reforms. By the 70s, there was even a fashion industry and a limited free market. The economy grew and grew. Many people had two jobs. The black market boomed. Some even traveled abroad and saw Western wealth firsthand. The average wage went up, but inevitably the gap between rich and poor widened. Bolas Ladzlo spent four years in prison for his part in the 56 uprising. He came out to find the men with whom he had forged close friendships while plotting against the Soviets had become very different. I was uh, shocked. They didn't want to talk about anything, literature, theater, or, or, or love, or nothing. Yet by all economic measures, most were better off. It was uh, another kind of spirit that grew. Everybody is against the others. We cannot trust the others in such situation. Everybody has to reach his goals uh, individually. Only to show off. I am more clever than my neighbors. I have a better car. And now they can die for a really good car. And they did. Between 1970 and 1990, where the economy nearly doubled, the mortality rate rose from 11 deaths per thousand to over 14 deaths per thousand. Male life expectancy fell by two years to an average age at death of 64. I found it very interesting, not having lived through these experiences and sitting at home in England and just guessing what these health trends were about. The sources of the cohesion earlier, I think I had misunderstood. I hadn't realized how important the sense of opposition to the Soviet occupation was. And in that sense, it makes it more like Britain's wartime experience than I'd understood. Can the state of mind of a whole society affect individual health so profoundly? Can a feeling of solidarity translate into a healthy heart? Can a sense of belonging to a community stop cholesterol building up in the arteries? The Hungarians under communism, the British during the Blitz are tantalizing glimpses of this. But the firmest proof of all that community spirit is good for health has to come from far away from either country.
Bless us, the Lord, and desire gifts to our bounty, Christ our Lord. Amen. Saturday evening mealtime in the small town of Rosetto, Pennsylvania, 200 miles from New York. These people once lived in one of the healthiest communities in the Western world. Even today, there are some remarkably fit old folk. How old are you going to be on your next birthday? You want the truth? I want the <laughs> truth. All right, I will be 80 years old on November the 17th. Congratulations. I'm uh, going to be 73, uh, June 24th. God bless you. You look terrific. Thank you. And I have seven chills. This is Dr. Stuart Wool. In the early 60s, in what became one of the most celebrated studies of community health ever, he investigated these people. What he discovered is today called the Rosetto effect and is an unequivocal demonstration that society affects health. We found, in essence, that uh, over the past six years, the death rate from heart attack was remarkably low. Less than half that of the neighboring communities, less than half that of the average for America. So we decided it was worth studying. The Dr. Wolf study attracted much media interest, including this US TV documentary, because it flew in the face of conventional wisdom about diet. Initially, Dr. Wolf and his team of researchers had suspected Rosetta's health was due to a Mediterranean diet imported from Italy. They had to discount this after discovering the local tradition was to cook in lard. By and large, they eat, let's say, a fifth more in the way of calories than the average American does, and that they certainly eat as much animal fat as the average American. This is Mr. Dennis Ronco, who is the town druggist. The Rosettan diet seemed to create only one ill effect. In fact, that they use a, 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 a large amount of laxatives, such as X-lax, and they use antacids. And yet, there were only half the heart attacks in Rosetta, as in the neighboring towns. Perhaps there was a genetic explanation, something Rosettans had inherited which protected their hearts. Dr. Wolf studied the full-blood relatives of Rosettans who had moved to other areas of America and saw that they died much younger than the ones who stayed behind. Soon Dr. Wolf concluded that the secret to their health was their community spirit. For the first half of this century, Rosettans were poor. Three generations of a family lived in one house. The gap between rich and poor was narrow. People shared scant resources. They were an isolated community of Italians, surrounded by Welsh and English immigrants who looked down upon them, using them for cheap labor. These Rosettans who came to the United States in 1882 uh, had to be cohesive because they were so badly treated by the people who were already here and they needed uh, laborers in the slate quarries, and they paid the laborers very, very little, and they, they shunned them, uh, uh, did not include them in their community very well. That was one of the reasons that the Rosettans built their own town. Almost all the residents of Rosetta are Roman Catholics, but life for most of the townsfolk set her here. Ritual and particularly Catholicism, was the glue that kept Rosetta together. But while this film was celebrating Rosetta's traditions, it became clear to Dr. Wolf that the young generation had no real interest in keeping the old ways alive. They wanted uh, to be more like Americans and uh, acquire a lot of uh, good things for themselves, and especially automobiles and uh, things of this sort. And they wanted to be more independent and not be surrounded uh, by as a community uh, to be their world, but wanted to uh, go elsewhere. Dr. Wolf predicted that within a decade, Rosetta's heart attack rate would double and reach the American average. It did. When we re-examined the whole community in uh, 1985, we saw lots of uh, zippers on men's uh, chests. They look like zippers, but it's the result of, of course, a, a hard operation uh, 
for coronary disease. It's an old-fashioned Italian chicken roast, and I'm putting lard on the chicken roast, which is unheard of in today's age because of cholesterol and fat, but I'll tell you what, there's nothing like. Connie Bath still remembers the good old days. She tried to fight the tide of Americanization that swept Rosetta, but by her own admission, she failed. Could you come here, please? The contrast of her views with that of her son, 19-year-old wannabe rock star Adam, couldn't be more stark. When I was a kid, I always felt my future would be as a mother and a wife. I always knew I would have more than one. We have four children, two boys and two girls. Uh, my ideal kind of setup is just me and maybe a girlfriend or a wife and a kid, tops, no, no one else. I, I could never have moved away from home without having my family close by because they're always someone that you can lean on and call and say, what am I going to do? I need help. Well, send one of them up here. I'll help you out. I don't know, just that everybody gossips. Everybody has to know everyone else's business and, you know, it's not really like an impersonal place. And that's how I'd rather, it's where I want to be. My oldest, he has an attitude. He definitely does what he wants to do. I feel as though we have no control. No, I have to get out of here, definitely. The difference between Adam and his mother's views set up a question for us all. Whatever the benefits, how many of us would really want to live in societies heavy with ritual and tradition where individual freedoms are curtailed? Or perhaps we can learn from Rosetta without duplicating it. The lesson is not to turn the clock back but the lesson is to recognize that people need people and that people are not only happier, but they're more effective and they're healthier if they are interested in each other. But what does all this mean for people like ex-civil servant Richard Campbell? A man whose work gave him a heart attack. He can't exactly create a little Rosetto in southeast London. Or can he? There's no doubt that the eight different pills he takes daily are very important to his recovery, as his diet, exercise, and all the standard health advice. But the latest research suggests that just as important is the fact that he has a close family, several good friends, and is an active member of the local scout group. We've got to organise a hike for the scouts. When have we got to do it? In a few weeks' time? Three weeks' time. Three weeks' time. Three weeks time. Researchers at Harvard University in the United States discovered this year that people who are members of clubs, churches or associations live longer than those who aren't. Well, it's off the map, actually. That's all right, I'm OK. I've got my glasses. And encouragingly for Richard, they found that heart attack survivors with no friends are twice as likely to have a recurrence within six months as those who have close bonds with two or more people. My neighbours used to uh, cut the lawn without asking them. They just did it, knowing that I was having problems. My friends would be involved. They would phone me up to see how I was, always asking if they can help. And if it wasn't for my family, my wife really helped me out. That's it. <laughs> the moral of all the parts of this story is that camaraderie and togetherness are deeply beneficial. Science says having friends is a good health strategy. It's official. <laughs> but for Richard Wilkinson, there remains an important caveat. He believes there is a limit to what individuals can do. The nature and organization of our society has a huge influence on how easy it is for us to forge links with others and reap the benefits. I think it's absolutely essential not to forget is that the amount of social cohesion in society is driven very largely by the amount of financial or income in, uh, differences. 
So societies that have big income differences very rarely are cohesive. Politicians of all hues talk a lot about rebuilding community spirit. Doing so may be a lot more important than they realize. Richard Wilkinson's number crunching and the work of many other scientists across the world points to one overriding conclusion. How we live affects how long we live. An aggressive, hierarchical society where everyone competes fiercely against everyone else may or may not be good for the economy, but it's certainly bad for our health.